So the last few years has been a total disruption to the way we were doing things, not just our learning, but our lives. People are working from home. I have colleagues who are tuning in from their bedrooms. The separation between work and home, the space has been erased. The journeys, the traveling, the motion that we used to go through in our commutes is gone. My Presto Pass still worked today, but it's been three years. I had to dust it off, go to talk to somebody to relearn how to use it. Everything's changed. And there were many that were disproportionately affected by the last number of years. Those who couldn't work from home, those with comorbidities, those who were doubly marginalized and therefore vulnerable, even more vulnerable than normal um, to the viruses that are floating around. And now it's not done. We've got our under fives, right? And it's not just COVID, now it's RSV. Anyway, all right, not gonna get depressing. <laughs> What happened in the last few years though, was it amplified what wasn't working in education. It brought it up immediately. We had to shift immediately and we had to do things differently. So I wanna spend some time today talking about that and talking about what gifts we've gotten in the last few years. One of those is the re-examination of what is essential. I think we learned that early on, who is essential. So I put some terrible questions together, but before we get into that, I'd like these folks to introduce themselves to you and to each other. Is it okay if we start with you, man? I mean, I don't really want to dominate the in-person interaction, but I, I don't mind starting first. So um, yeah, I'm Matthew R. Morris. I'm an educator in the Toronto District School Board um, from Scarborough, from the east end of the city. Always have to shout that out. And um, my primary passion, lens, focus, entry point is considering the pathways in which um, Black males and masculinity in general can be looked at as a means to validate particular identities, specifically Black male identities, um, through public schooling. For the last decade um, and beyond, I think, it's been a challenge, it's been an obstacle um, there are ways in which particular bodies within school systems ostensibly don't belong to those systems. And at a certain point, those bodies feel it, um, they know it. And um, in the last three years, I think- Okay, don't do that yet. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm a teacher, an educator, a writer, <laughs> and uh, the author of a forthcoming book, Black Boys Like Me, coming out in the fall of 2023. Yeah, write that down. I forgot to say what you Sorry. should do. No, you did everything perfectly and I hadn't even said it. Um, introduce who you are. Uh, take on that awful, awful question. Awful because we don't give it enough time. Where are you from? And then talk about one thing that you love about teaching and learning. And you did all those things, all right? So here on this screen, I can see Mark, you're in the top center box. Do you mind going first? Sure, no problem. Um, I'm Mark Campbell, assistant professor at University of Toronto Scarborough. Uh, like Matthew, I'm Scarborough all day. I've been born and raised out here. And that's where I'm from. Um, and that's where I'm lucky enough to teach. Um, and I'm not sure what else I should say. There's lots of things I, I could say. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. If that's good. Mark is also a sneakerhead. Like, talk about one of the things that you love about teaching and learning. Oh, wow. There's one thing. Wow, this whole room knows the sneaker. Oh, no. <laughs> Come on. My students don't even know. Actually, my students do know. They see every week. You've got um, beautiful sneakers, man. Yeah, what, what I, I mean, now I'm completely thrown off, Jess. I'm, I'm completely <laughs> unable to focus here. Um, but I, you know, I, in terms of thinking about working on the edges here, there's a, a bunch of work that I do in, in different areas, uh, you know, around, uh, I archive Canadian hip hop digitally, um, and do artistic projects. I'm a curator and a DJ, um, and bring those practices into, into the classroom. And, and, uh, obviously these things intersect with technology. So I'm, um, you know, I'm invested and concerned, uh, as to how. Uh, pedagogically, we we uh, 
we keep moving this forward or moving some of our projects forward. Beautiful. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mark. All right, uh, let me try to remember who is in the upper right. They're doing all kinds of funny. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, go ahead. <laughs> go. Was it Lorraine in the upper right? Okay, we got some people with photographic memory. Lorraine. Hi, folks. Uh, I hope I'm unmuted. I just got two options Sounds for great. unmuting. Great, thank you. Uh, so I uh, am Lorraine Randall. I am so grateful to be here and so thankful to Jess for bringing us all together. Um, I always say a friend of Jess is absolutely, uh, you know, a friend of mine and I'm very excited to be a part of this. So I am calling in from Hamilton, Ontario, and uh, I uh, am born and raised in Niagara and uh, moved recently to Hamilton. But uh, I love Lake Ontario. So anywhere around Lake Ontario is good for me. What I love about teaching and learning um, specifically is I think uh, opportunities for transformation. And I, I think that happens for students, for anyone kind of on my side of things where, where you're in the position to help support uh, that transformation and to you know, be witness to the different ways that that happens. I think the thing that is uh, different about me is I'm not uh, you know, a professor, I don't have a PhD, um, but what I do have is an intense level of engagement with education for my entire life. Having been a person who is uh, on the margins as, as always kind of a bit of a weirdo, what, what I value and what is important to me is around how we recognize value, what we identify as skills uh, in learners and uh, how we measure success. And that for me, a lot of the time comes out in talking about literacies and uh, accessibility. So thank you. So Lorraine is an autodidact. Lorraine is also uh, a, just a natural educator, an amazing inspiration. And uh, that person that will go in and, and help to dismantle the systems. So it's awesome to see you, Lorraine. Okay, who was the person? <laughs> Mindy, you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mindy, and uh, I work at Centennial College in the Center for Faculty Development. So my primary fo focus right now is faculty development. Um, I was hoping you wouldn't pick me next. Lorraine <laughs> said a bunch of stuff I was planning to say about why I love teaching and learning, and now I don't want to say it. Um, but um, I think for me, what I love about teaching and learning and what I love about education is that I think it is a helping profession. And I think that um, in my current role, I'm very privileged to work with other faculty um, and at the base, helping them come to the, hopefully an understanding that the power inherent in their roles is something that can be used um, and leveraged in order to help other people. And well, anyway, that's what I love about my role in teaching and learning anyway. So thanks. Mindy and team at Centennial are doing some really cool stuff around inclusion and around education and coming up with very compelling ways to reach faculty. Thank you, Mindy. It's awesome to see you. Lynn, I'm just so glad to see you. So good to be a part of this, and miigwech. Um, first, just want to start by saying um, I'm coming from the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg peoples and uh, covered by the Upper Canada Treaty and protected with a dish with one spoon wampum agreement. Lynn Trudeau and Nindindikas, Sagamak Anishinaabe Nindjinjaba, Anishinaabe Kwe, Mixu Nadodam. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lynn Trudeau. I'm um, an Anishinaabe woman and I'm descendant from Ojibwe bloodline specifically, and I'm Eagle Clan. And um, yeah, I just want to say miigwech. Um, uh, nice to see you, Jess. <laughs> As, uh, uh, getting to know her, Jess was a wonderful experience. I, um, I appreciate you inviting me uh, to be a part of this. And I don't really, um, I was thinking, what do I really appreciate about teaching and learning? I guess is walking into the classroom, whether it be hybrid, face-to-face, uh, However, I encounter students, just um, the potential 
that it that you feel that good energy sharing um learning it's reciprocal i learn as much from my students as they do me so that that sharing and um most of my work is is through a decolonial lens so i um i'm really i feel i need to be in education i have to be in education i'm in education because my ancestors weren't allowed to sit at this table mm -hmm. i'm here because you're uncovering our little brown bodies right now um just uh so there, there's lots of reasons why i'm here and i'm here uh, the Anishinaabe have this way of saying um seven back seven forward so i'm there for those seven back but i'm telling you i'm also here for those seven on the horizon and um so in short teaching and learning is medicine to me miigwech that's seven generations. How many of you have thought about seven generations forward, seven generations back? That's my buddy, Lynn. My, my dog, Cooper, has a big crush on her. <laughs> so do I. She is one of those people who has opened my eyes in ways that we don't get that opportunity all that often professionally. Um, she's knocked my socks off. Each of you has knocked my socks off. Um, thank you for... Uh, mentioning the land that we're on. I hope, uh, Lynn, that you will speak to uh, the difference between safe and brave spaces. And when I think about you having told me about that, um, it, it still hits me, gives me chills. Um, maybe we should start there. Uh, years ago, you said, you can't guarantee me a safe space. And I, I, I can't stop thinking about you saying that. Uh, this was the land your ancestors were on. A couple hours away, massacres. As you said, brown bodies are still being dug up. You can't come in and say, I'm a well-meaning white person, be safe here. Best you can do is create a space where I can be brave. So Lynn, your words are etched on my mind, never to, be erased. And I hope you'll bring that, that badass attitude to these conversations. So the first um, question that I have is, if each of you can share an anecdote, maybe we'll go backwards, we'll ask Lynn to start. Can you share an anecdote that stands out to you, um, for you, or pops into your head that can demonstrate some of the challenges you and others have faced in the last few years? And this is um, the folks on the on the edges, the folks for whom the last few years weren't just a vacation to hang out in your study pants with no socks on. It was um, the people who suffered through that time. So Lynn, can you start us off? Uh, sure. I think, um, I don't think I have a one specific story I can share, but um, it's been kind of touched on. So I, I, I'll kind of go there. Um, having as you mentioned, um, having to jump online from, from being face to face. And I think um, that really opened up a sense of vulnerability for a lot of my students. Um, vulnerability in, in ways that we didn't anticipate before, that um, they had to open up their homes. Um, some were very uncomfortable um, showing their homes. And so uh, the story that kind of comes out of uh, what's been happening in education is that um, everything that happens in society, societal beliefs, societal issues, societal attitudes and behaviors are, are in our classrooms. They're in our education realms. And um, so I think everything that was going on with the new, a lot of movements happening now also played a role with um, how our, our students were um, interpreting our education um, that, that we're trying to give them. And I think, uh, knowing that um, that it's actively present in our classrooms, what was happening, um, and with George Floyd, how that's kind of um, really opened our eyes to many things. But and in that time that was happening in the states, here in Canada, from April to June of that same year, six Indigenous people were killed by the RCMP. Um, Aisha Hudson. Jason Collins, Stuart Andrews, Abraham Netanyahu, Chantal Moore, and Rodney Levi. So we have our own um, 
issues here in Canada. We don't have to look next door. Um, and being very supportive of the Black Lives Movement uh, needs to come out in our classrooms because again, um, what happens in society affects our students as well. And I think um, opening our eyes to that is a little bit more um, apparent now. I think we have to kind of remap our classrooms to include things that are happening outside um, our own little brick and mortar that we used to feel so comfortable in. Um, and I think that a sense of liberation has to come with education as well. And I think just one way that I found that um, I've tried to implement is honoring each student um, with their own ways of knowing when it comes to even something as simple as um, assignments. We never used to really think about that before, write an essay handed in. For me, like that doesn't work. I've always been a visual learner. So I think we need to look at each student and honor them, whether they're tactile learners, audio or visual, and allow them to um, reciprocate and respond to how they wanna represent their knowledge. And um, yeah, I, I don't wanna go on too long. I, I'm really interested and love to hear what um, everyone else's thoughts are. So miigwech. Thank you, Lynn. Um, MMIW, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women has an, its own acronym now. They mm -hmm. say their names, right? Lynn yeah. just said the names of those six indigenous people who were killed during that time. We were supposed to have gone through an awakening. Who the hell was sleeping is what I wanna know. And, and did they wake up? Did something change? Lorraine and I wind up talking very angrily about issues of class and how in, in inclusion conversations, class doesn't come up. Lynn's talking about students who are embarrassed to turn their video on because what's behind them. Lorraine, you wanna pick up this thread? Uh, yeah, happy to, and, and thank you, Jess. I think uh, we do frequently talk about class, and I think it's uh, it, it's been really um, marked for me, the difference in how people are able to engage technically as kind of the first order of accessibility with online, online teaching. And that technical challenge is, as you know, it gets perceived almost as though it is an interpersonal problem. So for me, I had students who weren't able to use video at all and who had to fully engage only through voice, um, which when they were, a lot of my work that I do with students is collaborative group work. When they're doing collaborative group work and it's design-based, so often it's quite visual. So sometimes that was seen as though their group mates weren't engaging with them in the same way or that they weren't engaged in the work that they were doing when really it's about their ability to access the space technically, um, you know, in an equitable way. And unfortunately, um, that was, like I said, kind of the first order of, of how technical challenges showed up and, and class. And um, I think one of the other pieces that for me was really marked uh, in how students were engaging was with, with a lot of my international students who were coming in from for live lectures, uh, calling in from India. Uh, call, I had someone who was calling in from, from a slum in, in Kenya. So I had really interesting, um, I mean, it was, a, it was a great experience for me just as a human uh, to recognize my own bias in, in what uh, that might look like, but also um, just seeing the difference in how engaged students almost had to be beyond their technical capabilities. It felt like a, like we expected more almost from, from people who were calling in from India to stay awake until three o'clock in the morning to show up for a lecture. Like that just, um, it wasn't, it wasn't a great experience for, for lots of people and not always a class thing, but definitely, um, the way that technology showed up, I think, as, a, as that kind of first bump in the road was really, really obvious. And obviously, uh, oftentimes was along, along class and, and economic lines. Imagine, Mark, this is coming up for you and your students. You're doing special projects. You're doing cultural events. You're doing work with musicians and artists. Can you talk about how you've seen this kind of disparity um, amplified? over the last few years? 
Sure, no problem. I mean, I could echo almost everything that was just said in terms of what I saw with my students, but um, I, I also, I mean, part of what, what um, was going through my mind at the time and, and not knowing the details, but knowing that one assumes that the home is a safe place to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and for some, for some young people, it's not as safe as we imagine it to be. Uh, it's not, a, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not all of the things that we think it, 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 it is in terms of being conducive to learning. So for some students, especially the ones I had who were either in South Korea or somewhere else that was 12 hours away, um, it was, you know, really about trying to be um, generous and giving people the benefit of the doubt and, and, um, and, you know, knowing that I didn't need to see them to have a good class with them but trying my hardest, um, you know, to make sure that that they felt like it was a space that was um, a learning space, you know, a safe learning space. Um, so I saw a lot of that. And, and you know, I was also on lots of sort of live Zoom performances uh, with musicians uh, in different places in Canada. And, um, and part of what, you know, what, what was, what was really clear where like the early adapters that could flip from platform to platform, um, and and um, you know people assume that it's uh, young people can and do um, become early adopters to technology, and and there were so many instances where that was not true, um, and it had an impact on how well someone could participate in the class. Like especially if you were using a collaborative whiteboard like Miro or Padlet or something like that. And, and the hardest part of, I think, being an educator in that space is knowing that you, you have to assess the final product and uh, the participation grade really doesn't really matter in, in a scenario like that. So um, those are some of the things that sort of reared its head um, during the last couple of years trying to do this work. That's why I get rid of grades altogether, uh, which is a luxury. I, I don't ask permission, but I just do it if anybody wants to... Hey, Jenny. If anybody wants to find out um, how that's done, uh, let's talk about that some more. And speaking about this international dynamic, um, Mindy, so much of the population at Centennial is based on international students. Give us some wisdom, drop some wisdom on what's been going on for the last few years. I think uh, wisdom is the wrong word there. <laughs> um, I don't know that I have any wisdom about that, but I think if, um, I think what stands out to me and one of the things that I remember most is having a conversation with a faculty member um, where they felt exceptionally helpless in helping their students, um, particularly a student or many students, I think in China at a certain period during mm -hmm. this pandemic, um, who you're trying to follow up, they were trying to follow up and say, um, well, you haven't done the coursework. Is there anything I can do to help? And the students literally said, I'm starving because I can't leave my home. Um, and that, uh, that made me quite sad <laughs> to hear that, but I don't think it's an isolated story. I think it was happening a lot um, in different spaces, not just in China um, here as well. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that I have heard of in speaking to the faculty at Centennial, particularly in regards to international students. Um, and it's not something that I think anyone ever addressed really well. And, I'm, and as we move forward um, in this new age of offering, <laughs> online programming that is continues to be one of my concerns. And I think it's, it, although it may not be the same scenario that continues to pop up, it is an example of um, how much harder it is to reach our international learners, particularly if they are overseas. It's so much of a call toward humanizing learning and treating each person as an individual within a context a context that might not be safe, as Mark is talking about, might not be an ideal learning environment. You've seen all of these things, I imagine, in your yeah. kids. Yeah. And it's, it's wild to hear all these different stories, right? Because I can, I can relate to every single scenario, 
from everybody, from what everyone else has shared, right? And, and I think the two things to me that stick out um, in terms of um, what, what have been the, some of the biggest cha challenges um, is one that education, schooling, it's, it's an institution, right? And the whole idea of institutional expectation for better or for worse, it's been completely shattered, right? Mm -hmm. there, the, that no longer, everything 2022 and beyond, um, everything surrounding education must be questioned because of what happened in 2022. We literally out of necessity and survival had to question everything, right? And the other thing that I, I think everyone, the other aspect that I think um, everyone has kind of touched on is the notion that learning, teaching and learning is, is so multidimensional, right? There, there are so many aspects that bend and mold and shift and transform into each other to actually make teaching and learning functional and successful. And for me, um, I come from somewhat of a little bit of a different um, position because I teach kids, right? I teach 12 and 13 and 14 year old kids that are at the beginning to understand themselves, their families, their communities, along with math, English, science, photosynthesis, all that other <laughs> stuff, right? So um, one experience that was just seared into my head was I was in the middle of the day teaching, it was like a math block and I don't, I don't even really wanna call it teaching. I don't know what it was that I was doing, right? Um, and a student- Gesticulating. Yeah, a student, <laughs> a student asked me um, for help on some, the, whatever math concept we were learning. And she, and she was trying to type it out in the little Google classroom thing. And I'm like, I don't, like, what do you mean? I don't understand, like, cause it's math too. So it's numbers and probably like a bunch of other stuff. And I'm like, just, I get the whole not, no camera thing. I'm like, turn your microphone on. Like, just talk to me for a second. And she's like, I can't. And I'm going through my Rolodex of like all the reasons. Okay, why, why not? Is your computer broken? Are you on your phone? Do your headphones not work? Why can't you? And she was like, she, she turned it on for a second and turned it off. And then she, she said, it's too loud in my home. Like I, you won't be able to hear me and I won't be able to hear you. Yeah. And then I pictured where she lives, this area of Scarborough near Orton Park in Lawrence. The home is probably 500 to 600 square feet. I, know, I taught her older sister. I know she has two other siblings. I know she has a mom at home. She probably has her mom's, her mom's mom that lives there. There's probably seven, eight people in a house. Three, four of them are student aged, adults. They're all trying to cohabit, live, survive in this space and this child is trying to learn and there are so many obstacles for her to learn right and it's something that i never obviously never considered before so that was just one one moment in which i i realized within public education right now everything has shifted and because everything has shifted, we have to do something optimistically. We can't, be, we can't take just the negative and focus on that. We have to be optimistic about how to best address the needs in terms of equity, learning, teaching, because at this point now, everything is different, right? The expectation is completely different. I hope everything is different. I hope you'll, I hope you'll educate my son too. I want him to have a, a teacher like you who gets that and understands that everything has shifted. If you all have stories like this, or you don't have stories like this, or something in your educational practice or your pedagogical approach hasn't shifted, please come and talk to Matthew. Please come and reach out to Mark, reach out to Lorraine, to Lynn, to Mindy, because I think that this is our, this is our inflection point. This is where everything can change. So that's where I shift to this next conversation. What did we get? What did we gain from this? And what don't we wanna lose when we go back to that supposed normal that we know wasn't normal, we know it wasn't equitable. We're talking about the technology that we used for the last few years to make sure that we were able to um, 
I was reading that, um, <laughs> to make sure we were able to still interact. But we know that even on those platforms, we had the kids who could and the kids who couldn't. As Matthew speaking about it, as Lorraine speaking about it, right? As Mindy's talking about it, as Mark is talking about it, as Lynn is talking about it, all of us have experienced this. So how does equity fit in here? What did we learn that we can take away and not let go? Who wants to take that one on? Just unmute yourself. Go Lorraine. I just, I have a story that fits so kind of interestingly in this last conversation that we've had and actually broaches this next topic. Um, because I talked about technology as kind of the first hurdle, you know, if you could engage, that was one hurdle down, but it didn't mean that the rest of the hurdles were not there. And I think um, really considering because I come from a, from a digital and design background and very much UX fo focused and very much uh, trying to understand how the experience is mediated. For me, there was really uh, what I walked away with is such an incredible recognition in the nuance in human interaction that is um, really difficult to choreograph uh, through a mediated kind of technological space. So seeing how, um, you know, even when I had students who were not dealing with kind of that first barrier of entry of, of technology, that there was still um, a barrier in the connection between the humans. And I am a very gushy kind of a person, you know, I'm very much uh, the person in the classroom who seeks connection with all of my students and wants to create space where connection is formed between them in groups, you know, in collaboration, collaborative spaces. So for me, it was really quite challenging to figure out how to kind of support making those connections happen when, when you're working in a group in one space, it kind of happened in a, in a more natural way. Um, one of the things that I think Mindy brought up that I think is really important too is that students didn't always share what was happening uh, personally with them, that they would show up and, you know, if they turned their cameras on, which was pretty rare, um, that the, they would just show up and kind of sit and, and listen. And it was not the same kind of understanding of what was going on for people. You know, I'm very empathic. I can usually feel if somebody's, you know, off or there's something in the room that doesn't feel right. You don't have that ability when you are, you know, mediating a digital conversation as you as you would in a, in a space. Um, and what it ended up taking uh, in one of my classes, and this was early on in the pandemic, was me being very deeply vulnerable as just a human being. Um, in a leadership conversation, we were talking about leadership. I told them a story um, that was deeply, deeply personal. Um, probably the institution might not actually like it. Don't tell. Uh, but uh, how can I how can I make this happen in a way that feels you know like an exclamation point like it matters like it's important and it's going to connect with them. In me sharing that story, I had students in that class um, in an online class, and it was master students. So let's take that into account here. So they're older, and a lot of them are are you know kind of in professions already, et cetera. But many of whom um, actually started crying when I told the story, which surprised me. And I thought, oh no, I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble because they're, you know, I've upset the students. However, um, they started sharing their own experiences yeah. and it became a conversation about, you know, I lost my grandfather two weeks ago and I didn't tell anybody because, you know, my classmates don't know. And, sharing that with the class, you know, and people understanding, oh, that's why you didn't, you know, send us that thing on time, or that's why you didn't do, but people weren't, weren't sharing at that level. Um, I actually, in this, in this experience uh, that, that I'm talking about, had one student say to me, um, well, say to the group, and this is a student who, you know, I don't know for better or for worse, the, my, my, my definition of her is she uh, is, you know, in the armed forces, she's quite a tough cookie. She's, uh, you know, not the type to get really gushy. Um, also very emotional and said, this is the first time I felt human online. Wow. And, and for me, um, that recognition that there is some way, some way to make it happen. There's some way, I, I don't know what specifically it was. I don't know if it was me being willing to be vulnerable. I don't know if it was just the timing. I don't know if people were just ready. Like, I don't know what it was. But creating that space for sharing and human connection is, I think, you know, that second order for accessibility 
in, in learning online? Like, how do we do that? And I think is one of the things that I'm always going to carry from that experience is like how much it matters to have just nuanced interaction that you can't, you know, you can't turn off the mute button and be like, okay, now be spontaneous. Like that's not how it works. Mark, you want to pick up there? I see you nodding a good bit. I imagine you have something to add. Yeah, I just wanted to say like part of my, um, I know we're not talking about our own strategies, but part of um, what I'm hearing from Lorraine is, is uh, I amplified the vulnerability of, of myself every single time we got into class so that my students knew that, you know, um, I'm the professor, but I'm also human. So uh, we would talk, I would, you know, most of my classes, I would begin with talking about how I felt about whatever the weather was like that day, just so that the, the beginning part of our time together, it started with, uh, it didn't start with um, sort of the, the way that we normally come into a class. So people don't come into the room with anxiety. People aren't necessarily, well, they do come into the room with anxiety. Um, but the idea was is to make mo make oneself vulnerable so that we could amplify our human connections. And then we could learn something because we were all, um, you know, um, trying to adapt quickly to a bunch of things. So that's the only reason I was nodding. I didn't have anything absolutely wonderful to say, Jess. No, I mean, that's great, Mark. And absolutely talk about your own individual experience. You have two boys too, two young boys. I imagine they were in and out of school constantly. Let's not forget, this wasn't just pedagogy and teaching and learning in Zoom in the last few years. This was our families going through this with us too. We did this humanizing learning project. Thank you, BLS. Um, and, and in it, we made a reference to rent. Like, how do you measure a year? It wasn't just in pedagogical shifts. We had people who lost their parents. We had people who had surgeries, got citizenship, moved, right? Had car accidents, had trauma. We are human. So how do we humanize this stuff? I saw somebody say early on in the pandemic, you can't build trust online. I call bullshit on that. Lynn, these are situated spaces that we're in. And in some ways, I wonder from a feminist perspective, if you, I'm going to put it all on you, um, <laughs> this forced us to see quite literally, quite acutely, us in a situated space. We couldn't ignore where we were, who we were, where we were from. Can you speak a little bit about that from, from your own perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, uh, I, <laughs> I do teach uh, indigenous feminisms, but I think I want to take this question um, on it in, in a little different way, if, if that's all right. Absolutely. Yes, when you're talking about it really uh, pinpointed and, and situated the students and uh, or even us where, where we were. And I think that comes back to exactly what you're just saying, talking about all these other things that were happening like you know every, everything was still in motion and, and well a lot of things were and a lot of things weren't and i think um mother earth herself needed that pause when they when everything started shutting down it was the first time some salmon came back in certain areas it was the first time um there was more wildlife that started entering coming out because um we weren't there to to keep them to keep, to keep them away so what what it also said too though was and this is this is still in the realm of education, but um, one of the COVID, one of the first thing they told you to do, make sure you wash your hands all the time. Make sure you always wash your hands. Great advice. But what if you don't even have water to wash your hands? Right. There's so many um, places in Canada right now where Indigenous people don't even have access to clean water. So how is that? How are we going to take up that very first step in trying to heal ourselves and keep ourselves safe? And um, I think there's a lot to be said about that. And I think um, I would just kind of like to touch on um, what you started with me at the beginning, Jess, is, um, and I'm, no one can guarantee a safe space for anyone. I would like to think when we have these conversations, perhaps we're trying, trying to make a safer place, but I don't think we can say safe. Um, and, and, and that, and I, when we push that next forward to that brave space, well, who's, who has to be brave? It's the same people who can't be safe, right? And we're taking that on as an educator sometimes, which is a whole nother more work. Um, and so, 
my, my, I guess my, my worry is when, when we all come together and, you know, a very diverse, we've got some important shit to say, <laughs> I'll just say, I think, um, yeah, we can share these stories. We can tell some hard truths and do uh, truth telling, I call it. But my biggest concern is well, who's doing the listening? You know, like wh what, where is all this and or where does it go? So I think even after brave spaces, there's got to be like accountable spaces as well. Yep. And then you hold yourself accountable, but but then what? Is there's got to be like um, imaginative spaces and what we can imagine our spaces, what we want them to be. And then there has to be spaces of action. Like all of this is good and fine, but if no one's listening and no one's enacting and embodying these words, then I fear that we will return back to that that old normal, which actually should never have been normalized in the first place. So I think we're going to be remiss if if that's if that's what we go to. And I think um, part of anything I've learned in the last little bit is um, you have to when we all we all each have our own vision of what we'd like to see, whether it be a just world, a peaceful world, um, a change world that we have to be that change. That sounds a little cheese made, sounds a little old, but um, if you're not acting towards and um, doing and trying to be what you yourself want to be, then, um, and, and if there's no table that you're allowed to sit at and have a conversation, I say build your own table, you know? So I don't know, I, I won't go on too much longer. So uh, miigwech. I mean, who's gonna stand up here? That's not the right answer. Who's going to stand up here? He will. Who else? Come on, folks. Who's going to stand up here? You're supposed to stand up. <laughs> I'll stand up, Jess, but. <laughs> or make your arms go up. <laughs> Seriously, I think the challenge these days, Lynn, should be. If you're not going to stand up, I want to see you sit down. You're absolutely right. Accountable spaces, brave spaces. And when I think about the future, you can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> when I think about the future, I think about Whitney Houston, because I believe the children are our future. And you are actually, you're raising these kids. This is the time, those formidable, those, those uh, formative years when they get the expectations of what's it like to be an adult? What's it like to be a man in this world during things like Me Too, George Floyd, uh -huh. the awakening where nobody wakes up? Uh -huh. That part. And um, it's, to me, to me, I think it's, I don't want to say it's simple, but I think that oftentimes we forget that youth have valuable and truthful opinions. And a lot of times what's happened over the last few years is it's a bunch of adults going back and forth, yep. talking about how they feel, how they feel when they don't put on the, when they're facing a bunch of uh, blank screens, how they feel when they're teaching and the kids aren't yeah. responding. Yeah. Right. Where's the conversation that prioritizes this particular youth culture at this time? Because make no mistake, this youth culture is different. Can you imagine growing up in this day and age where you can't even go to the bathroom with your own thoughts? Like you go to the bathroom and you're on TikTok <laughs> and TikTok is like, crazy dopamine like every 15 seconds and somehow the algorithm even for me as an adult somehow it finds the videos that I want to watch can you imagine being 12 13 years old and you got to fight that you got to fight a general to be honest apathy that has always been within education sitting on the fringes where there is a collective um collective energy where it's always been the youth are either going to meet this standard because this is how it's always been done. I term it as legacy pedagogy baggage, where a lot of <laughs> educators, they'll get into education. You should have saw how I dressed when I first started teaching. 
I like this. It works for me. <laughs> it wasn't. I had to go to. Um, yeah, the sh I, I've been there a couple times. I've never been back. Some of the stores, the shoes I was wearing and stuff like that. They serious I shoes. I thought that's how educators yeah. were supposed to look, and it it translated towards my pedagogy, how I taught, yeah. what I valued, what I didn't value, right? And we've been in that mode for so long, so many decades, where. I think one of the good things, again, one of the good things that has to come out of this is a re-questioning of, of what pedagogy looks like. That's right. And I think that needs to be contingent on the voice of youth culture, right? I, I don't think that we can continue in where I sit in terms of elementary public education with adults making every decision in terms of what education looks like next year, the next five years, the next 10 years, because there's never been a time in public education where the gap between people making decisions and the individuals, the groups that have to endure, experience, navigate, learn in those environments has been so different. Yeah. There's never been a gap as different as it is now. So I'm, a, I'm an optimistic person. I do believe that there's there is light at the end of the tunnel, but we have to find those, those, the itty bitty spaces in which we can validate and prioritize and, and, and put youth culture on a platform in some way, right? Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on, on, on these conversations and, and my brain goes in a lot of different ways, but, but I try to keep it simple as possible. And I, and I think that if we, provide youth culture in some capacity with a platform yeah. to, to allow them to navigate this educational experience and where we're going with it, with, along with us adults, then, um, then perhaps we'll be able to arrive um, somewhere where it isn't the old normal, a new normal, so to speak. That sounds good to me. I told you the shoes mattered, Mark. The shoes <laughs> mattered. There's two minutes. I, I can't, I, I think the, those are Timberlands. I can't really see what, what shoes there are there, but they, they do, they convey a message to your students. They um, do. And this goes yeah. back to my good friend, Lorraine, when she says, you've got to know the system well enough to know how you can fuck with it. Right. Mm -hmm. You bring your shoes. Yeah. If I'm comfortable down there, I'm going to be comfortable all around. So that's right. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Mindy, what's going on with your shoes? How are you shaking things up over the centennial? Um, uh, most of the time I'm not wearing shoes anymore. So yeah, <laughs> liberated. Um, uh, there's a lot going on as I'm listening to people speak, but, um, I think the one thing that is becoming that I want to speak about right now, if that's okay, is in all the conversations with the students and the faculty and, and taking up this opportunity um what stuck out to me that Matthew was saying was that huge gap between administrators yeah. and learners um and I would probably argue that that gap is also getting really huge between administrators and faculty as well yep um and I think what has concerned me over the past two years is in as much as we talk about how technology can be wonderful and some of the challenges around that. Um, I think we're almost setting a new piece of baggage on the legacy pedagogy <laughs> baggage in the sense where what I'm seeing is a prioritization of using the technology to make classes really shiny and new um, and a decentering of the reasons why we use technology and the reasons why we teach. And it's creating almost like I feel like a frantic energy at my institution with the faculty where um, there's, I'm really hoping I get fired for this. Um, it's a, like there's a push for all of these different types of ways to engage students through technology. There's a push for what on the surface seems really student centered in um, let's offer students as much choice as possible in terms of how they want to join this class. So whether it be synchronous, asynchronous, high flex, like all of those options. Um, and these choices are being made for us. We're being told you must present these choices. And there is no conversation about whether pedagogically that makes any sense. 
Um, and I can't see the crowd right now. I'm hoping I'm getting some nods from the <laughs> um, but um, and that that scares me. Uh, that disconnect and uh, what it highlights to me is that in as much as we aren't educating our students to make those informed choices about their own education, um, we also aren't doing that for our faculty as well. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a double disconnect here for me. Um, and there's a there's a precedence being set right now that technology and cho and choice through technology is the new thing and we haven't really sat back and thought about that, um, about this bridge. And I think this links to your last question, Jess, so sorry if I get there a little soon, but that, what do we need to remember going into this new normal, right? That really highlights it for me um, because we seem to be forgetting <laughs> yep. a lot of that um, and rushing into this kind of new era where we can get even more people into our classrooms by offering this choice. And for me, that's really problematic. So now I don't even know if what I said was related to what anyone else said, but like Mindy it got off my chest. It's <laughs> brilliant. And I think that if you're not worried about getting fired at least once every week, then you're not, <laughs> you're not pushing hard enough. So I think you're doing awesome. What, so we have questions, what's happening? Uh, we have about two minutes for questions. If there's anybody in the audience who'd like to ask a question before we wrap up. Here's your big chance. I want you to know these names, write them down. Lynn Trudeau, Lorraine Randall, Mark Campbell, Matthew Morris, Matthew R. Morris, Mindy Lee. Hi, <laughs> thank you very much panelists. I really appreciate everything that you have shared. I have a question around toxic positivity. Hey. <laughs> really tough, tough topic because folks who are engaging in it are doing so with positive intentions, right? They want folks to feel com comfortable coming back to places in person going back to the way things were. It's really, there's a positive intention there, but what it communicates, I think, is that I don't care what happened to you. I don't care what we learned over the past three years. I just wanna forget it. And so, but I don't wanna lose the positivity aspect. So how do we remain positive while acknowledging the things that have happened and the things that we've learned? Who wants to take that one? I could pop in. Uh, my wife and I made a New Year's resolution this year that we weren't going to spend quality time with people who didn't understand nuance. And <laughs> that meant both people who were just entirely too negative and people who were entirely too positive. Like it's gotta be real or we're not coming. <laughs> Do you want to come in there? Uh, it's tough because I'm just, from my perspective, I, I, in, I teach elementary school. You so I see it every single day, what you're talking about. On one hand, the uh, pandemic happens. And of course, it affected the culture of school, the culture of education. But then on the other hand, how much blame do you put on what happened then in relation to what is happening now, if, if that makes sense, right? So, and we don't have the answers. No, that's why right? it's gotta be nuance or-, or Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think that there's an answer to this one. And I actually yeah. like this one, Jenny, because I, I think that most of the world's questions that really matter are not gonna have a clear answer. They're gonna have something like a gut feel, right? An intuition. You know that the last number of years have been really tough on everyone. You know that pretty much anybody over the age of fill in the blank is, has experienced some form of trauma, right? You know that there are some people who do their best creative work in the dark. A student of mine said that last night. She comes from the negative space and that's where she writes most of her creative work. She got really riled about the patriarchy last night. 
another student works from the positive. He wrote a poem about love and about reconciliation and sort of moving forward through blurry lines. I think you got to find the middle. I, this is my new obsession, by the way, the middle. Lynn, Lorraine, Mindy, Mark, anything you want to add to that? Toxic positivity? Um, I just wanted to add, uh, just because um, I, I know we're, we're running late, so I'll be real quick. I don't know how it um, it is with with uh, to toxic positivity, but I, I, I noticed um, we're still using these words like, uh, and language is so important, is a new normal. Let's not use normal. My normal is not your normal. My equal is not your equal. Um, can we just say we move towards a new, a sense of new energy, you know? I like that. I was just listening to um, a podcast about metamorphosis and caterpillars actually turn into mush before they turn into butterflies. I think we're, yeah, I think we're in the mush. <laughs> yeah. Let's you know, they digest themselves. I know, it's, it's so, really cool. It's fascinating. <laughs> but they also maintain a memory of what it was like to be a caterpillar and their hopes and dreams are in there too. I think that we're, we're going through this metamorphosis and I hope that when we get to that table where we're building the butterfly, that these, these cats are there with me. You know, Jess, also the cells yeah. that are the butterfly cells exist from the very day one of the caterpillar and they're called imaginals. And the, the imaginal cell inside the caterpillar is there with all of the potential for the butterfly just waiting for it to be digested so that those imaginals can enact themselves. Imaginal so I think gross mush. It's you gotta you gotta go down to your base components before you can rebuild rebuild. That's right. I think that's where we are. Anybody else want to have the final word? Are we supposed to wrap up? What's happening here? Oh we're just getting warmed up. I know. I know. Oh, there's someone. <laughs> This thing on. Oh, there we go. We go we're going. Um, Jess, Matthew, uh, Mark, Mindy, Lorraine, Lynn. I uh, just want to say thank you very much on behalf of eCampus Ontario for sharing your stories, your experiences here with us today. I think uh, you're sending us all away with a challenge. Uh, so, me which for that. Uh, thank you. And uh, to our audience, enjoy the rest of the day at TESS. Thank you. Thank you.